What's up, everybody? It's the Hardy Construction. You can find us at hardyconstruction.tumblr.com, youtube.com slash hardyconstruction, as well as facebook.com slash the Hardy Construction videos comp, and... Smilers Toothican. Today's film is... <laughs> Jacob's Ladder, 1990. Jacob's Ladder, 1990, which is one... 90. Nine- Nine zero. Mourning his dead child, a haunted Vietnam War veteran attempts to discover his past while suffering from a severe case of disassociation. To do so, he must decipher reality and life from his own dreams, delusion, and perception of death. Directed by Adrian Lin, written by Bruce Joel Rubin, starring Tim Robbins, Elizabeth Pena, and Danny Aiello. Wow. So, Danny, why did you pick Jakob Slater? <laughs> because I've never seen it, and wow. it's always... It's always appealed to me, like I've wanted to see it. So, yeah. have you seen? Uh, you've never seen parts of it, at least on television or something like that. I know I've. I, I, I somehow completely missed it. I think that's so. the same case for me. I think I've seen it on television, but it was something that I wasn't interested in watching. But then after I'd seen this film, I got severely upset at at the lack of big budget psychological horror films that are out. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like watching this, I was like, I was like, this is a horror film in its own league. You know, sort of how the yeah. This um made me think of that uh, District Nine level of a horror movie. District Nine, or, Session wait, Nine, fuck? Session Nine. Session yeah, that's nine. what What's I was gonna District say. Nine? Uh, I would say What's Session District Nine was the last like psychological horror that I could remember. I think there's one that came out called A Cure for Wellness that just came out with the guy who directed The Ring and um the original Pirates of the Caribbean films. That one just came oh, out. Okay. So I want to take a look at that. That looks like super highly stylized and big budgeted for a horror film. Like a psychological it's horror It's just film. Johnny Depp going through the makeup process. And there's sort of... <laughs> no, it's not. It's uh, <laughs> da- Dane DeHaan, who is an actor from the fantastic Green Goblin from The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I don't know if you've seen that one. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, okay. What a movie. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that was, I think, the last psychological, latest psychological horror that, that came out and nobody saw it. And, but, you know, it's, there's like certain films like Rosemary's Baby or The Exorcist, obviously, stuff like that. These Although, I wouldn't say, though. I wouldn't say The Exorcist was a psychological horror. I think it was like an out and out horror. Um, yeah, The Exorcist was an out and out horror. But this, this is, in relation to the exorcist, Jacob's Ladder in relation to the exorcist of how it treats the material, like serious, like it's a you know a serious horror film, an adult horror film, and yeah. I just kept thinking about how now every other horror film is sort of just like genre, which is not bad, you know, but it it doesn't have the same impact. Like you, you're just sort of expecting the boo. Do you know what I mean? Even with films like mm-hmm. films like I enjoyed, like I, I was discussing this with somebody today. Uh, it follows, which I actually enjoyed, but I like that, you, movie. that film is more in line with a teen slasher horror, even though it's much better than a teen slasher horror than it would be to saying. this film. Do you know what I mean? So th- there's like specific beats and visual cues and and a sense of story playing out. Anyway, so Jacob's Ladder. So you'd never seen this film, and I I saw parts of it young when i was right. younger i was always aware well aware of it but i was never interested in watching i don't know why you know there's a lot of films i just never saw as a kid and you know watching it now i'm glad i saw it and it stars tim robbins who is like i think he's more known now it's before for being... he was framed for killing his wife <laughs> tim robbins yes right for the shawshank redemption very good reference there <laughs> I, I almost got i was like did he kill susan sarandon uh, no, he actually killed his relationship with susan sarandon because uh they divorced Booyah. remember there was a big uh big thing no you didn't probably give a shit but they divorced and they're you know they were like together for like 20 or some odd years and susan sarandon she has big jugs for an older lady that's what she's more famous do you think that's why he left um, her do you think he wanted smaller jugs maybe he wanted a downgrade he's uh he's he's trying to be you know because he's conscious about the uh uh the earth he wants to Mm -hmm. have less carbon uh emissions less of a carbon footprint yeah yes less of a carbon footprint when he's motor broding i mean uh, think of the amount of methane that those jugs put out <laughs> uh so anyway it's so funny when you see susan sarandon now she's like 60 or i i, I believe she's in her late 60s and she still wear, wears those like those low-hanging dresses with her Damn big it. knockers Damn hanging out and uh <laughs> what did you say damn it nothing it's quoting this thing um oh oh damn it jennifer anyway nice, nice so tim jump. robbins Good is job. playing uh jacob and jacob uh is a guy who is it starts out in vietnam right good old vietnam, vietnam. Uh, 
do you, uh, was your dad in Vietnam or was he a, a no. filthy dra- da- daft dra- a draft dodger? No, he didn't dodge. He wasn't <laughs> Just kidding, uh, joking. Accepted for some reason. Yeah, um, my dad went to Vietnam, so the less said, the better. Anyway, okay. so uh, obviously Vietnam is a very focal point in this film. This is a movie that was written by the writer was Bruce Joel Rubin, and he actually wrote the script in 1980. It didn't get produced until 1990. The script, he wrote this after he had a nightmare where he was stuck in a train station. And that's why there's a pivotal scene. <laughs> you say yuck like if you had, you had the idea of that happening to you. And, no, uh, it's just that scene is, like, scary. Yeah, it is a very spooky scene. It's a very uh, chilling scene, actually. And uh, funny enough, there were scenes that they cut. There Apparently a lot of stuff got cut out of this film. Uh, because yeah, I believe was that, that the, all of the scenes that we watched. No, actually, that... that's that's like four out of probably twenty scenes that could cut out of this film. Because there was a scene yes. where I think in the train station where he sees a man raping another man, and then another guy comes up to him with a knife, I guess, to maybe rape him too, and he runs out of the room. Jacob. Um, so is it all in the same scene where he jumps on the track? I don't know. I don't think it's in that scene because I think that scene is like everybody. The whole train station is abandoned. There's another scene that I think you and I saw, and the, the deleted scenes where there's a guy washing his feet in the sink and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that they cut out. But anyway, this film starts out in um, Vietnam. So these uh, young gentlemen, this battalion, are waiting. Or they're actually just chilling because there's nothing to do during this uh, while they're waiting on uh, on finding out when the VC which would be I don't know if that I guess that's not a racist term right is it I don't know what? the, the no, Vietnamese Viet Cong. Uh, Viet Cong there you go I thought it was some racist word they're I waiting for the that's racist I've always heard it called that I mean I could be no, I know the actual racist word for it. I'm not gonna say it, but they had. Well, I know that word. Yeah. <laughs> they had the v- the Viet Cong. They were waiting for them, and it actually had. There's like a bunch of actors that I was like, really good actors, well known actors in this scene. There's Ving Rhames yeah. is in there. Ving Rhames. Uh, I recognize the other black dude. But known as uh, Marcellus Wallace from uh, Pulp Fiction is Eric LaSalle. He's a doctor from ER. Eric LaSalle is a very good actor that's not used in anything else. He was in ER. He was like uh, the main um, black doctor. Uh, oh, okay. Next to the so other white doctors, from, yes, the white doctors. That must doctors be where I know him from. And um, he de- he has a great scene, right? Remember when he has that phone call and he like tells him not to call him back, and he just has that really sad look on his face. And I was like, damn, that's good acting. And he didn't even like do that much in the scene. He was just like sitting there yeah. looking sad. And I was like, no, I and, totally uh, recognized him. Like I watched when ER first came out. I watched like the first like four seasons or something. Oh, like, okay. And there's a, oh my god, in. how could you deal with the jargon, the technical jargon? I of was show? like a kid or something. Oh, you know? actually could sit. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. It was like moon. I speak was just. To it me. was just on. Like you know. And there's that one actor. Oh my god, who's that one actor that uh, I recognize him because he was like he's one of those actors that you see in everything, but you don't know his name. He looked like a Danny hick. Ayala? No, I know oh. Danny Aiello. He he looked like the hick. He was the the uh, hick guy who um. The uh, one that he was on. Him first. I think the explodes. Not that guy. That guy. That guy was um from a, an episode of the X Files. I remember him like clearly, because <laughs> okay. um no yeah because he has like some weird thing with his eyes in, in that episode of the X Files because his eyes have this rapid movement that they don't stand in this film they're normal so that makes me think he didn't have that disease or he really doesn't have the disease and he's just a fantastic well, no, actor. his eyes were moving weird when it was showing. Oh, were they? Yeah. Well, he them. actually has a a rapid eye movement disease. Um, that his eyes can't Weird. stand still. It's like, but I, for the life of me, I can't think of the guy's name. But he was in a great episode of the X Files where he was like playing a serial his killer. His name is Pruitt Taylor Vince. Is that it? Uh, yeah. I and so, yeah. but the other guy is this other guy. I can't think of his fucking name. But he he, he was in an episode of uh, Married with Children playing like a hick, like one of the Bundys. Is, uh, oh, like, he's one of Peg's. Uh, yeah, relatives. one of Peg's relatives. And I was like, I know that guy, and I've seen him in a hundred million things, but I just can't think of the actor's name. And of course, the the best uh, cameo. Well, besides that, I think I swear to God, I saw Louis Black in here. You know the comedian Louis Black? Yeah, I know Louis. Yeah, Black. he was in. He was playing Jacob's doctor, the doctor that wakes. You know, after he's in the bathtub with ice cubes, he says, no. "You got some friend." I swear to you, he's on the IMDb. I'm looking at it right now. He oh, was. Really? Uh, yeah, he's the one that he says, "You got some friends in high oh, places." Shit, you're right, actually. Louis Black. Like, and doctor. I was looking. At it, I did a double take. I was like. I was like, is that fucking uh, Louis Black? Like, I've seen Louis Black. Uh, like, he's one of the only, like, a handful of comedians I've seen live. 
I've and actually like, seen him at like several events that I've worked. And I, I someone was like, "That's Lewis Black." I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" It was pretty cool to see Lewis Black like serious and not like pointing his fingers and shaking them around and yelling about the government yeah. and shit like that. It's cool to see Macaulay Culkin like him as a too. really little kid. Like this is before Home Alone even. Yeah, this is before the superstar man. I was waiting. You know, at the end when he's leading him up the stairs. I was waiting yeah. him for for him to run up and then Jacob to chase him and then a paint can a paint to hit bucket. him in the head. <laughs> and he says, "You guys give up? Are you ready for more?" Well, or you like see, that. you know how it was having those demons with the fast moving heads. You see him put his hands <laughs> to his cheek and he's just like, ah, and then like he starts doing that, <laughs> slapping his hands to his face and his head shakes like a maniac. Yeah. Oh God! But of and course, you see, you see Tim Robbins like Kevin. <laughs> He's on a plane somewhere else. Um, but of course, the greatest cameo in the film—it's not really a cameo because these people weren't cameo. These were like actors. It's Jason George. Alexander as a uh, Geary, yeah. the lawyer. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, what? It, was it was so weird funny. Because he was like a totally different person. Of course. It, but he, he, also, if you see the movie um, Pretty Woman, he plays a rapist, an almost rapist in that one. So if you really, really want to see it, yeah, he tries to rape the pretty woman, uh, Julia Roberts, She's in that a, film. And she right. kicks his ass. Um, much I like don't. George, though. But the, I knew you know how pathetic George I am. Isn't a rapist. <laughs> but how pathetic I am as I was watching the uh, opening of this film and his name came up on the credits. I was like, "Yes, now I have something great to talk about in this episode." That's how pathetic <laughs> I am. And then I just kept thinking about what if, like Jacob, the, Tim Robbins, it was Jerry Seinfeld playing Jacob instead. <laughs> and he's just walking around. But seriously, what about these demons? <laughs> Why is that guy's head shaking? I mean, I don't get it. And then, he's and just then like, you see, you see Kramer come in with his hair and everything, but he's like one of the demon things, just like moving <laughs> all quick and shit. And Newman is the doctor trying to give him the explain the Jacob's ladder, and he's like, he does those big long monologues. Uh, and, and Elaine, Elaine starts dancing with Tim Watley, and Tim Watley comes with a black, big black like <laughs> alien penis through her dress. Very good. That's all I waited to do. Anyway, before we discuss this film, I wanted to just talk about a real bizarre supernatural occurrences before you even saw this film. Uh, okay. We went to the this New York museum. Uh, it's part of the Metropolitan Museum. It's called the Cloisters. The Cloisters. And, Very fancy. And you and I were just having some really useless conversation about Shaquille O'Neal, right? I mentioned I mentioned completely randomly that I saw a picture of Shaquille O'Neal standing next to the world's tallest man, which made him, which made Shaquille O'Neal look like a midget in comparison. Yeah, he's this tall man from China. He's like literally like nine feet tall. So then guy. I just I just uh, decided to talk to. I decided to tell um, Danny about this film start in Rush Hour Three. Where there's a scene where Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker have a fight with this enormous Asian man, which must have been the which same is, Chinese guy. Which is guy. the guy I was talking about. And later on in the day, we go get lunch with our friends, and I'm showing them a random vine on YouTube, which is like a hilarious. It's called uh, "Look at those, look at that stomach," though. Just YouTube. That's a very funny vine. And on the related video was that clip from Rush Hour Three. And then, of course, my friend uh, Cassandra says, "You know that uh, there are these pho- the phones can listen to you, and they'll just start <laughs> they'll randomly, and it, which made me incredibly as ridiculous yeah, as either, it sounded. It's either like um, <laughs> supernatural or it's like horrifying. Either yeah, way, it's like, I'd rather it be supernatural. But also, the I would se- too. The second weird thing that happened is that while we were at the gift shop of the Cloisters, we picked up a small toy called a Jacob Ladder." And we had just been discussing oh, yeah. how we were. <laughs> we picked this That's film. That's true. We did actually. We picked That's this film, weird. and the Jacob's Ladder is an uh, old fair's toy, which is like a it's an, an, an optical illusion. It's like illusion. these little wood blocks that are connected by string, and they yeah, they're an, an optical illusion. So it looks like the ladder is built, you know, rebuilding itself as you drop it or something like that. Anyway, but also the Jacob's Ladder apparently is a colloquialism meaning you know the point between earth and heaven. So I was doing a little research on this. Yeah. Um, we'll actually start discussing this film right now. It take us. <laughs> this is like probably our longest uh, bit of talking Intro. before the film. Um, but it, the film itself is a really interesting psychological uh, thriller horror film stuck in a dreamscape. And I knew what the ending was because I had seen 
the film in bits and pieces when I was younger, and I was like, oh, this is a bullshit ending. Because obviously we're spoiling the film. Yeah, I didn't expect the... Well, you've already seen it. I didn't expect the ending to be so straightforward, but at the same time, this is probably, like, one of the first of its kind before that became so cliche. Yeah. So. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting twist ending, and I think it's a better film that you know the twist ending before it. Do you know what I mean? Like... Had well, I, I, I could I understand if that, people. I didn't know that. I could Well, that's true. I could understand people being upset with this type of ending. Be, it's just like any like TV show episode or any film that has it an ending. It's all where, a dream. Oh, yeah, that kind of. It's all a dream bullshit endings where you're like, what? I just emotionally invested in something that didn't happen, which is a weird thing to be emotionally invested and upset well, about. Well, it did happen, though. He was fighting all <laughs> his demons and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there were some shit happened in there that, like. Like, the drug really was real, right? Like, they really did drug them. Yeah, uh, but I don't know if that's the truth. I think that's no, the question it, it that is. I... No, but that's the question that I have. I think that's what the writer's intent was, but how would Jacob himself know that that happened? Well, because even though he was... All of this was kind of like a hell, you know, accepting all this shit and moving out of hell into heaven, whatever... But yeah, like, but who's how, how really would he know? Have... Was it was it angels and demons that told him yeah, this? Like, no, because oh, like okay. angels, because angels really actually told him what happens. Is what I think. Why? Why go through the trouble? Why don't they just take him to into help heaven? him have to help him have closure, clarity and closure? All right, so this film starts out in uh, obviously in Vietnam, and we see these gentlemen just waiting around. It's a good bunch of group of guys that are having camaraderie with each other, and. Uh, all of a sudden, there's you know a guy says he spots a VC down the in the tree lines. He sees the tree lines moving. That's what he says. And we see a bunch of we hear random gunfire. Uh, Jacob runs off into the forest or what do you, I mean? Sorry, in the jungle. Well, uh, they, they're all having head problems and spinning around. And yeah, the time. one the one, uh, I think Ving Rhames starts having a seizure, and then the other guy Vincent Taylor Pruitt like he starts like he just sits down and he freaks out. Well, everybody else is like, you know, basically it's having... It's a very intense scene. It's a very intense scene. It's funny because it's a Vietnam film where there's not one Asian actor in the film. <laughs> not even the Vietnam right. scenes. It's all like white people killing each other. Uh, but we don't find that out until later. And after the scene, uh, oh, he gets bayoneted. Um, Jacob gets bayoneted, which doesn't make any sense because I don't think American soldiers have bayonets. I think it was the VC that had um, bayonets. Well, I know in World War II they did because my grandpa had one. Oh, did he? Yeah, I don't know, but that was obviously way before Vietnam, so I don't know. <laughs> this is a scene where essentially we can break down every scene that happens in the film. We'll cut it down a little shorter than that. But it cuts to, you know, he gets bayoneted and, bayoneted and he falls down, and he wakes up on a train, uh, on a moving train as he's trying to get to, um, oh, God, what the hell street was it? Gibbs? No, I don't know. Ber Berger? Berger? Ger Bergen Street. And um, he's like, it's a very weird, chilling... It's weird seeing the subway. There's like, like a there's like an Eastern European lady that's not asking him any, I mean, that's not answering his questions if they homeless man like he starts seeing tentacles underneath the the uh, sheets of the guy and stuff like that. It's really it's a really how would you yeah. explain or how would you come across you know explain to people what the imagery in this film is like the demon stuff. Oh, it's very yeah. It's um, funny because the uh, director of the film said that the original script that the demons were actual literal heaven and hell demons with horns and stuff like that and he wanted to make it more relatable because he felt like if people actually and in the end the writer you know yeah, actually said he that. agreed with his choice on that because he said that the director said that if there were actual monsters and demons with horns that they it would just be too fantastical to get it so he said instead of horns like he he pointed out a scene where the, he sees the nurse and her cap falls off and it looks like she has a growth on her head so that's a little bit more unsettling than seeing a monster with horns running around. For all she around. knows, maybe she had some weird skin condition where you grow teeth out of your skin. <laughs> well, it does happen. Uh, but that that whole scene with the uh, train station where you... And I, I'm wondering if that happened in the 80s. Like, if, you know, train stations got, like, shut down. How Imagine how fucking scary that is to be in a train station yeah. where you can't... And I'm you, sure it's happened. Like, uh, I mean, the train stations have come a really long way. I even as a little kid, they were like really creepy. Yeah, remember. But remember this is the uh, the New York City that you loved and you want back, and you're so pissed off I, that it's not like this oh, anymore. Oh please, there are bits <laughs> I <laughs> like and there are bits I don't like. <laughs> you got to take one or the other, man. You say you want it to be no, like back then. No, you could have. There's an in between between uh, <laughs> you know drugged out 
uh, scary crime and like hyper gentrification. There is an in between. Uh, you mean you don't like those uh fifty five dollar French fries with uh, palm, <laughs> I do palm love frites? Those. They are pretty good actually. Although I will say, I went to the palm frites in Union Square. It wasn't that good. It was like. It was just like French fries with mayo, and I was like, twelve dollars for this? Fuck off! You know, I want some gold leaf on my <laughs> on my hamburger. I better shit gold if I eat that. Uh, but there's that awesome scene with the train when he tries to, you know, dodge the train, but it happens every time he like steps on a track. Like he jumps from one track to the other, and the train is still coming in his direction. It's a really yeah. great freakout scene. Like the way that the the way how spookily this movie runs it it feels grounded in reality even though it's just like just shy of feeling dreamlike uh i don't know if that makes any yeah. sense it's just like right on the right on it's the edge surreal. of not being it has right it has a lot of panic attack feel it's the it's movie. the good uh, it's the good way of having surrealism in a horror film because you can really fuck it up like when when a horror film shows like a film that actually did it well as well i think was session nine but it really didn't do that many shock freakout scenes like uh, paranormal stuff in it no it was a very slow slow yeah there was only uh, like one movie. scene in that film when i think the main character has a dream and you see um some guy inside of a, an industrial sort of waste containment suit and then there's blood everywhere but i think the only thing that affects that scene is because the movie was shot on digital so it's a little cheaper looking um this is a movie we did and it wasn't good. It was a bad <laughs> version of this type of movie where it was a collection of short stories. It starts out, there's like these people driving in a car and the car keeps starting back in the same point. And oh, the same yeah, yeah. The the hell film, right? It was like, um, I yeah. can't think of the name of the movie, but yeah, we yeah we talked about that with Thea. It was a collection of short stories. In any case, they did a bad version <laughs> of what this movie does. Yeah, with the CGI uh, skeletons uh, flying on the air stuff. When we... When we find out what the movie is, I'll put it in the description. Yeah, it was a, it was like four stories in a horror film. It was a pretty bad movie, except for one storyline that was with the girl who got hit by the car. That was good. But also, this film stars Elizabeth Pena as Jezza. Everybody basically has a biblical sort of name. There's uh, obviously Jacob. He has his. He's named after the the Saint Jacob in that story, Jacob's Ladder, where. Um, I'm saying I'm telling this like you know the story offhand, but I think it's a story about a. Oh, uh, I remember that. My mother used to read that to me every night. <laughs> um, it's a storyline about a guy who. I actually, I just looked up the wiki and I completely forgot what the fucking storyline was. But it was basically a guy who's climbing up a celestial staircase, which originally wasn't the ending of this script, um, of like a real he heavenly imagery. But I, I really want to actually read the original script to this just to see how it's like. I'm actually interested in reading the original script. And uh, the original script, he actually turns into a light being and goes up the stairs. But I'm, I'm sure the director was like, what the fuck? Am, how am I going to put this on film, you know? So he, he, yeah. he said that he wanted to... <laughs> Imagine they just, like, <laughs> cut in a scene from the abyss where those, like, snake <laughs> water monsters. And uh, I'll tell you this. What what did I see? Oh, I'm thinking about Cocoon. Cocoon scared the fuck out of me when I was a kid. When they, they turned into those aliens, holy mackerel. That, they turned into light aliens. That's scary shit. Anyway, he wanted to have the ending be um, a little bit more based in the fact that heaven is some place where you want to be so he was at his old home going up his staircase with his son which is you know that's like heaven to him he's ascending the staircase into his house and the writer uh and the writer says that he still feels that, which i sort of agree that the ending sort of comes out of nowhere and it's not earned even though you know thematically it makes sense the writer says it still feels like the ending just kind of abruptly happens where you know it's just what, like the writer is insulting the movie no but they he can have an adult conversation he wrote a film and the director's job is to sort of convey that storyline as close as possible or to his own vision and they still have you yeah. know disagreements about it like you know i mean you can you can talk about something like I can yeah I guess so you can write I something mean, and I can much. draw something and then have it out and then you can ha nitpick what I did just because it doesn't follow what you do, do yeah you know but what I mean? not in the public eye if we agree it doesn't matter agree, you can yeah. like if you have a conver I can understand being you that's know, like that's like going behind your back and being like hey everybody I don't like the way that he drew this thing <laughs> but uh, I, I could understand the conversations about them they're adult men they're like uh, they're not childish assholes like you and I so but anyway Elizabeth Pena uh, playing Jezebel she's a very uh, spicy Latina oh, woman she was hot in this she's movie she's the worst 
Oh, well, you know. She, yeah, the the part where she talks about the dead kid, that's pretty bad. Like, I was like... She's, she's like, the most, like, but emo- she, the, like the non-emotionally thing is, supportive girlfriend you The thing have. is that she's an invention of him, so she doesn't really exist anyway, so... She, yeah, I know, but, but like, before you know that, it's like, whoa, she's, like, so not... Yeah, it's very... Like, like, I mean, obviously, she... I think she cares about him, but she's selfish. That's the kind of character she is. I love... I love the chiropractor. And, uh... uh she's the best. And Jezebel is, uh... I guess she works at the mill post office that he worked at uh so he kind of just that and, and it's explained midway when he wakes up during a dream with his ex-wife while current wife at the same time it's a very convoluted sort of stuff that's happening in this film but jezebel is uh by the way um elizabeth pena which is very sad uh she's an actress that was in a couple of films she, yeah she died she died of li- cirrhosis of the liver which made like she Man. drank a lot which sucks because she's a very talented actress obviously in this one too and she was like only 55 years old and she was in uh yeah. she was actually in rush hour one to go back to our rush hour films and she's playing um his uh latina they had a lot of spicy latina like they were actually you don't actually see spicy latina girlfriends in movies anymore like they had her they had the chick from um what was that arnold schwarzenegger movie where he was uh running oh, man right. uh, that hot sp- no no running man oh yeah i guess he had a hot spanish girlfriend now too but uh, you know well, Sh- schwarzenegger she's maybe schwarzenegger was uh yeah <laughs> schwarzenegger was into that hot latin ass he still was you seen the that hot maid that he had sex with have you I, seen, did, I actually never saw. Have her. you seen that maid that he slept with? You will, you will wonder what happened. Like, she looks like the predator. Like he wanted to fuck the predator. <laughs> it, it, I'm not you, joking. You and I, I feel bad that I said that right now. Obviously, because you know, I shouldn't judge people. But you really should see what she look. It's, uh, it's astounding. Like maybe, maybe the predator really affected him. <laughs> he I mean, really in did. It. Like he, she took the mask off and it was he still has nightmares of when he had to wear all that body paint and hide and set all the booby traps. Like he has nightmares of that time when he was hiding in the log, waiting patiently. He and just probably just stepped over the trap. She probably like it was weird because he had a baby out of wed, you know, wedlock while he was married to Maria Shriver, and uh, he was porking this um, he uh, monstrous maid. While she was married, they had a kid, so that her husband thought that that kid was her, his kid. Right. Isn't that dirty? That's just like gross. Imagine the baby comes out with like Arnold's face. Like, he looks like Arnold face. Schwarzenegger now. He like takes him to. It was so funny because his his kids with Maria Shriver, like one of them's yeah. like a three hundred, and we're not shaming, but the, one of the kids is like a real fat kid. Uh, I really? I can say this on fat kid, and. Uh, but Arnold Schwarzenegger takes the illegitimate kid with him and lifts weights with him, and he's huge, and he looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But he doesn't do that for his own kid. That's no, because I guess the Shriver kids are Kennedys, and they'd be like, I, I, oh, I don't want to do that. See, that's my Kennedy voice. <laughs> uh, anyway, back to... Uh, I, I actually wanted to just what make... What kind a... of fucking Kennedy accent was that? <laughs> that's a Bostonian that accent. Horrible. Like, I, I, come over here. All right, I'm horrible at bostonian accents anyway i just wanted to do a joke where schwarzenegger was telling the the uh the maid come here kill me you know but all right, i just want an old <laughs> tangent but yeah so why do you think he's thinking of this woman jezebel as like this taking photos of his wife and like burning him and, and this is his idea of being in hell oh like he oh that's right because danny aiello is his chiro- chiropractor and he tells him and he even says he looks like a cherub, a cherub or whatever, and like he is. Like when he's an in light, he looks he's like, like an, angel. an angel. Yeah, um, talk a little about Danny Aiello. Danny Aiello is one of those oh, guys. He's, the best. he's like a like, white. I love him. He's like a white version of a black actor, where like once he hit a certain age, he's looked like that age ever since. Like Samuel Jackson. There's like right. very few white guys. There's a lot of black actors that look the same after they hit like 25 years old. But Danny Aiello has looked like this since forever. I don't know what Danny Aiello I, I ever... Can't, I don't have Wi-Fi at this moment, so I can't look at his IMDb, but I know this guy from so many things. Like I oh, Danny Aiello has been every... Uh, most famously, I think... Uh, well, one of his most famous things is uh, Do the Right Thing, where he plays the pizzeria owner, and they blow up his fucking pizzeria at the end because the uh, cops choke uh, Radio... Was it Radio Rahim? I believe is his name. Uh, they... It's a good movie. Okay. Anyway, uh, but it's a very racial uh, but movie. But yeah, Danny Aiello is like basically his guardian angel, like mafioso type of 
<laughs> chiropractor who's like so gentle with him. Yeah, and, like, he's a nice guy. Him. He's like a father figure. He's basically but his, he, he's his like guardian like angel. Going crazy in the hospital. That was awesome. Yeah, he's like a he's he's his basically his guardian angel. Um, he's like you know a father figure type guy. I wish I had somebody like that that would like go insane and rescue me from a hospital and stuff that's me danny i'll do that oh would you do that if i break my leg will you go into the hospital and fight the yeah remember shoes? remember when we you had the toothache and i was like here go to this hospital and then i said you know what i'm just gonna go to my house and i let you go by yourself see that's true I, that's actually. what i'm guarding you and then you didn't even go to the hospital uh another cute thing i, I like how how um <laughs> i'm really not a scumbag <laughs> i swear true stories actually <laughs> He's gonna hang up midway. Um, I like that cute scene where the uh, black girls are singing "Wait a Minute, Mr. Postman" to him while he's walking away. Because yeah, I've had that have that's happened to me before. Like cute, uh, cute black chicks when they sc- they sing to you. Because uh, I remember I was do- jogging around Parkchester in New York City, and this this uh, cute no black chick to me. This cute black girl started jogging with me out of nowhere to like race me, and I was like, I was already halfway half asleep running, and I just let her win. I was like, ah ha ha! I was like, oh my god, I was gonna barf, but she was a very nice girl. <laughs> um, but How come nobody ever plays games with me. What, what I understand is that when nobody likes you. Uh, the weird thing is like Jacob. Does he never say his name? Because remember, he's always asking for Doctor Singer. I didn't get that until the very end that he he is Jacob Singer because he was like, where's Doctor Singer? No, well, we they call him. We hear his name a lot. I mean, what do you mean? No, but th- th- isn't he looking for a doctor at the... Uh... He's, no, he's looking for Dr. Carlson or it's something. It's Dr. Carlson, like... okay. Uh, so that was a guy who yeah. died. Okay, I'm getting confused. So, But um, there's that other... Uh... Yeah, the guy whose car exploded. Uh, and we meet the nurse with the fucking spikes in her head or whatever. Obviously, the best... One of the most like, insane scene in the film is when they're at that like that dirty sex party it looks like an awesome party actually i oh, used to go to great, i used to go to parties like that all the time when scene. i was a kid oh when i was a kid when i was a teen uh, when i was more of an adult <laughs> when you were like four or five <laughs> when i was you know when i was an adult and um like it's just like a sexy party is people all dancing his girlfriend's getting like dancing with one of her neighbors really sexually and he's just like a white guy that doesn't dance i bet you if you just if you just cut this one portion out of the film out and you showed it uh-huh. to like alt alt right people, they'd start being so scared out of their mind because it's like a white guy <laughs> surrounded by all these ethnic people, and then he he sees his <laughs> he sees his girlfriend have a huge black pole but between her when, legs. But then when they start transforming into demons, he'd be like, "I knew it." <laughs> the alt because that's exactly what an alt right pussy would who just like p- collapse on the floor because he'd like look up and see all these black faces around him, scared like a fucking huge weenie. <laughs> Um, it was cool to see that, uh, I, like, everybody's, like, so adult, and everybody's having, like, adult conversations, and they're acting like, you know, people, like, when he has a conversation with the woman who wants to read his, um, his, uh, lifeline on his hands. Yo, I totally recognize her, I think she's from Law and Order or something. I think so, too, yeah, and she's reading, I think she has one of those really, like, complex names, because there's, like, a, it's not, there's an actress called CCH Pounder. I know that's not her because CCH Pounder is like a. It's a. That's like one of the most bizarre names. Oh, okay. That would be yeah, yeah. Her name, name is um. Woman. Her name is uh. No, CCH Pounder is like a woman that plays like in Law and Order type of you know those women in control. S. Epatha Merk. Merkerson. She's like the the lady that's like in charge of the. She's like the chief or or like a senator or something. Yeah, S. S. Epatha Merkerson. She is like like uh been in everything essentially. Her and CCH yeah. Pounder are like two like African American actresses that I've seen like millions of times, and I'm like, oh yeah, like I always mix up their names. I was like, is that C? Because the names are so fucking like unique that I was like, wow, yeah. what a name, like, CCH Pounder. Like CCH Pounder has to mean something. It can't like you. Your mom doesn't just fucking call you CCH Pounder. The name is like they have the baby, and it's like I want to name her. CCH Pounder. <laughs> the doc- and the doctors, like, look at each other like, what the fuck? But that little, con- you know, that conversation that he's having with the woman reading his hand, and then it leads to the scene where, he's, you know, that inf- infamous guy with the shaking head. Oh, and she actually told him he's dead. Yeah, she told him he's dead. Like, all throughout the film, they tell him he's dead. But it leads to an awesome freak-out scene where he opens up the fridge and you see, um, you see, like, the head, the head of, like, some dead animal in there. Um, I guess it was, like, a, por- uh, a pit, uh, not it was a, a pig, I'm sorry. It was a lamb, right. Um, yeah. I was gonna say it's a dog. I was like, no, that's not right. A lot of the creatures in this film are based on photography by a guy named Joel Peter Witkin. 
uh, like the guy with no legs, the the guy in the party, the the dude with no face and his head shaking around. Uh, that's yeah. uh, the director based a lot of that on uh, Joel Peter Wicken's art. Um, if you look at Joel okay. Peter, Joel Peter Wicken's uh, art has actually has a lot of corpses um, that are framed in a certain way that have they're really but they're fucking beautiful works of art but they're super disturbing looking they're a lot of like right. black and white stuff that you would expect to see in like a uh, nine inch nails type of video that kind of stuff cool um well, yeah you, like you, stuff, you should so. definitely look it up <laughs> but that scene alone where she's dancing like f- fucking uh she has never looked hotter in the film the the spanish girlfriend the the but then she's the transforming yeah, and then she has that big the 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 spike I guess goes inside of her and then comes out of her mouth in like a real obvious like dummy move and he flips out. He ends up having like a hundred and nine degree um, fever and it leads to that scene because I was like I, when I first saw this as a kid I remember seeing that scene and I was like what is well, he on like is he on fever. drugs or something? I thought he was like on drugs, but he obviously had a huge fever. Like apparently if you're over a hundred degree uh you'll drop dead like you'll actually die of it uh which is a very frightening thing that your body can burn yourself yeah, out you could die you could like and um <laughs> it leads to you know flashback of uh jacob with his family when they were happier his two kids his three kids they also had religious names but i'm blanking on what their names was and little Jed, Mac- Jed, macaulay uh, yeah Jed and uh, uh, i forgot the other one but like it really is like in like macaulay culkin's actually a good actor in this film because he's not like He's not a horrible actor in, in Home Alone, but he's a horrible actor in Home Alone. You know, what I mean? he's not—he's not as what bad as mean? a kid. He's like, you guys give up? Are you ready for more? Like, he does that? Well, I mean, yeah. He, in this, he's just a kid. Yeah, he's not just being like a kid. He's nice. A star. He, his son. Uh, apparently, that was added in later in the film when he gets hit by the car. Like, I don't think he was originally in the script, so that's a smart idea to have him. Okay. You know, I was like, th- I was a little confused about the timeline. So this guy. Jacob goes to Vietnam after he already has a wife and kids. He gets drafted. Yes, I think what happens is I think he had a wife and kids. I think he was studying to be a professor. He was a professor of some or something. He went yeah. to he had a wife and kids. They were growing up while he was in Vietnam. His kid got killed while in Vietnam cuz uh, Jezebel says that. Uh he comes back and I guess they just couldn't you know, make it work, so he leaves her. Oh, no, I, he didn't make it back from Vietnam. He got killed in Vietnam. Yeah, he didn't make it back. He died. <laughs> I'm making so up, I'm like, fucking up the storyline. Yeah, he died in so Vietnam. So what I'm saying, when did, he, when did he find out, how does he know that his son died? Yeah, if see that? The kid they, died. There's a lot, because he seemed like he was laughing around, joking around in Vietnam. See, that's yeah, the weird... Yeah, he was laughing yeah, around, like, so he was in Vietnam, his kid died while he was in Vietnam. He wouldn't be laughing at making Yeah, they're making jokes. masturbation jokes in Vietnam. So I don't think he really realizes... Like, he wouldn't realizes. have been laughing if his kid had just died. Yeah, so see, that's why... He found out his kid died in the afterlife. That's why I'm wondering like, about stuff like, how did he know about, you know, certain things and how... Well, I think, I think the angels told him, but, like, I don't think... I don't think there's any way that he... His kid might not have even actually died. Like, I think he like, did. I'm because a little confused. I, I think his kid actually did. I think that's just a um, a fuck up on the writer's part. That, that was like no, an I don't after. think it's a fuck up. It's just like there is like the angels told him all this stuff that happened. I guess like when I just wish I knew like a timeline. Of I just when think his that his son died. his son's death was so prevalent and haunted him. It wouldn't just be some sort of thing that he would obviously, but also he has a relationship with the girl a jezebel you know it's 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 a very good point that you just brought up that totally made me look at that in a different way but uh it leads to this the second half of the film sort of has for for a minute moment it's almost like an investigation film of like a big government conspiracy of the army drugging its uh soldiers to be better fighters it's almost like every for there's been so many fucking um, army films that have like psychological horror that is a super soldier serum. I I can't tell you how many fucking movies go that route. Yeah. And this is the only time where well, I was like Firestarter. And this is the only one where I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> I was like, I, I wasn't offended by it, you know, because I knew that this film was a little bit older. And I'm sure that's it's basically they're using the Captain America serum because uh, Captain America, the super soldier serum, has been from then. You know what I mean? That is an old sort of trope used in film. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, you know what? Uh, I'm stupid. The kid was killed before the war. Oh, was he? 
Yeah, okay, okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I like that. Very close to the war, I guess. But and so he, he thinks up this whole sort of... He, he sort of puts himself in his own war action film, his own mind, where he gets uh, picked up by Men in Black with that one Italian guy that's been in everything, too. That, you know that actor, the one that had the bag under his eyes? The, the fat yeah. guy? Like, that one guy. Oh, by the way, uh, that actor is Brent Hinckley, if, uh, the, the, the uh, hick from Married with Children that I saw. Um, oh, okay. If you okay, look up cool. Brent Hinckley, you'd be like, okay, yeah, that guy. I've seen that guy and everything. But anyway, he gets mm-hmm. picked up by guys like Men in Black guys. I mean, sorry, Men, <laughs> men in Black guy sounds like a gay porno. Uh, he's picked up <laughs> by Men in Black uh, in a car, and they're like, you know, you're talking too much. You know why they call he, he, I forgot what the phrase was. It was some stu- sort of lame joke about talking too much. And they try to, you know, oh, you're shoot drown. him. You're in over your head. That's they they manage to fit in a car chase scene in this film, which, you know, usually wouldn't be in this type of film, uh, which was interesting. And just to see that actor, uh, if, if you see the film, you'll you'll in, uh, automatically recognize the uh, the fat Italian guy in the film. But I can't. Yeah, and I, I kind of think I did recognize him. And uh, anyway, so, you know, also in the very beginning, you know, that scene where he's walking after the uh, he, he sees those girls singing Postman to him and that car chases him down the alley. We and constantly the guy Newman warns him. Yeah, we constantly see uh, a guy uh, named the New- You know, I didn't really Newman? think about it. Yeah, I didn't really think that I said Newman would be that guy, and his name is actually what is his name in the film? Uh, Michael Newman. Michael Newman. There you go. I had no idea that was totally see, weird. Newman is in the movie, and the car tries to hit him, and he just like he's like a, also a second guardian angel. But uh, after we saw the deleted scenes, he's not really a guardian angel. Do we um, ever find out why Jerry and Newman really? despise each other or is it just kind of always happened in seinfeld or what are you talking about yeah in this movie and in seinfeld yes. <laughs> so uh there's a scene after that scene is i love that part where the the santa claus steals his wallet and obviously yeah, when they take him dick. so apparently this is his uh um descent to hell because the director said that he wanted hell to be this sort of like originally was actually supposed to be in hell with monsters and stuff like that and the director thought about it. He said, well, why don't we just have him go to this, um, basically every layer he's going down and down into this um, weird hospital. Uh, it looks like an insane asylum that he sees worse shit. So, you know, this part he's seeing crazy people. And then he's starting seeing limbs on the floor and body parts and blood and all that shit, which is like a really effectively cool scene. And um, yeah. I, I got to say, one thing I got to say is that one hot uh, doctor chick that's working on him, she looks like a chick you'd see nowadays because she had those big glasses. I think that was, I think that was Jesse. No, 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 that's, yeah, no, that's later on. I'm talking about there's a, there's like a hot, uh, like African American doctor chick that's like when they're first putting him in. She's like this cute girl with oh, big okay. glasses. She looks like a total hipster girl you'd see nowadays. Hope she's still hot. Anyway. Uh, yeah, and uh, well, I think they point, f- I mean, it's they been f- like 27 years. So. They fit in the line where uh, um, he says Santa took my wallet, so obviously he looks like a crazy person. But obviously you see shit is hitting the fan, and the doctors have him inside this this um, medical if room. If this is what the afterlife is like, that you die, and like within the five minutes of you dying, like this all happens, I don't want to, like, I don't <laughs> want it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have much choice at all. But um, he's... Yeah. Uh, it's almost like uh, Danny Yellows has that Jesus role where he descends to hell and then takes him out. Like, remember that whole story when Jesus died, he goes to hell and he starts taking people, yeah. like, the good guys, uh, uh, quote unquote, with him back to heaven. Uh, so, yeah, I think Jacob does descend to hell where he's in this hospital. He wakes up, like, obviously he sees hell where all these doctors are surrounding him. For some reason, it reminded me of the scene from House on Haunted Hill when uh, that girl's walk. Did you see House on Haunted Hill when that girl's walking around with the camera? And she goes into an empty mm, room. A long time ago. She walks into an empty room and and she's looking at her video camera and there's nobody in the room but in the video camera is picking up a bunch of doctors doing a, like a fucking uh, surgery, which is like one of the spookiest things I've ever seen. And that automatically I thought about that scene. But it's ni- it's nice that Daniello is essentially playing, uh, you know, his uh, who's that? Um, uh, Guardian uh, Angel. Yeah, like a, a Wonderful Life. He's like that guy. Uh, the guy who who uh, who helps. Oh, uh, the one who's showing him around. Yeah, he's basically him, happen. and he's giving him nice little you know notes and everything uh, about life, and you know if a good if you're a good person, then you'll see angels. That whole deal. Uh, speaking yeah. about a little bit about the deleted scenes, because we do see the doctor explains the whole Jacob's ladder. I understand why they deleted them, but right. there was some cool imagery. Because in, in the original original like that one scene when he takes I guess the the anti. 
uh, ladder drug that he takes him? Because ladder obviously yeah. is a drug that this the guy. Yeah, guys, go on YouTube and watch the <coughs> Jacob deleted Ladder's scenes. deleted scene. There's a 13 minute version. That's the one that has a lot of scenes. Spoil it's them from now a, di- a it's bit, from so. a director's cut. Uh, apparently, that has a lot of the scenes. Like anyway, yeah, you hear him talking and shit. Because cool. Newman, towards the end of the film, Doctor Newman tells him that he used to be uh, a guy who made LSD, and the army says, "Okay, come with us, or you're gonna spend you know how many years in jail." So he goes over there, and they decide to create this thing called the ladder, which is a drug. I don't know how they administer it. I guess I don't know if it was like they put in it the in food. Their food. Okay, and they yeah. tested it on monkeys, and the monkeys went berserk. And then they tested it on the the enemy, which I guess were the VC, and they went berserk on each other. And then they tested it on the troops to. I guess they had to refine it so they can not kill each other, but they ended up well, doing worse. Well, they gave worse. them a really, really tiny amount. Okay. In for the Americans, and it still made them. Uh, go insane. And that was a very good acting scene by the guy who plays Newman. Like, I was like, why, why, where is this guy? Like, this guy's a very good actor. That one scene where he does that whole monologue about, you know, that they tested the drugs on the guys. Very yeah. fucking good and acting then, in that know, scene. And you know, his life, it, uh, he couldn't <laughs> take the torment anymore. His life went to shit. He stole drugs from Jurassic Park and <laughs> got killed by a dinosaur. He gained a lot so of weight. Think, is that what you're but saying? But then he moved to, he moved back to New York City and he became an annoying neighbor. And uh, yeah, but he uh, the, in the deleted scenes he gives uh, he gives a a droplet into his mouth which would cure him, but that leads to a huge freakout scene where the ceiling breaks and a and a creature comes out with its eyeball and like yeah, I monster. get why they deleted it. it was yeah, it's a little top, bit over the top cool. because like where do you go after that scene? That almost seems like an ending scene. Then it does like moving on to the next scene, and then the, and then another scene where Jezebel he confronts Jezebel and she turns inside out and turns into a giant creature that he fights. Um, that's actually in the in the deleted scene. He just sees her, and then he takes the mask off, and he sees himself. So he finds out that Jezebel is just a creation of his mind. But apparently, in the script, he actually fights Jezebel. Um, so it's a little too Luke Skywalker. Yeah, uh, and and, it, and I this is where I can understand where the writer says it's sort of he just takes a cab ride home, and he goes to his house, and then he sees his son Jacob, and he goes up the stairs. So it's he more like Gabe. I'm sorry, Gabe. And that's why when I was younger, I used to think the kid's name was Jacob because it was Jacob's ladder for some weird reason. And uh, Jacob yeah. ascends the staircase with his son into heaven. And that's why he dies with a smile on his face. Um, that's why I sort of feel like it sort of jumps to that ending because there is... It, it feels like this movie... And I love the movie. But it feels like there it's going through certain paths to lead to a storyline. But it's more of a... Um, what's that film with Robin Williams? Uh, what Dreams May Come? Oh, uh, yeah. What but even that had a plot at the end. We had to save his wife at the end from hell because she committed suicide. This sort of is just a guy going through the motions of death. And there's no real sort of... Uh, solid grasp yeah, of what's going so on. That sad in retrospect. Oh, yes, of course it is. No shit. <laughs> oh, my but, God. Um, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I think I, I can understand the writer's meaning of that. It sort of just jumps to him getting his son at the end. Like, there's no real... But you can't really have a conflict at the end if the conflict's all in the guy's head. Do you know what I mean? That's no, what I could I didn't understand. Think it felt rushed at all. It didn't feel rushed. It no, it wasn't rushed. Uh, it was just like it came out of nowhere, that ending. I don't think it came out of nowhere. It it had the fucking chiropractor explaining all that shit. Yeah. You know, then it flashed back to the chiropractor explaining it. He I always sort of, yeah, I, I think what it was, I was just sort of built up to see him face down something larger. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think after the hell scene, obviously he leaves hell and he gets back on his two feet. Literally, when when the guy chiropracts him back to, I don't know if that's the correct phrase, chiropracts him back to standing, uh, he's ascending. Uh, so I guess that's really the conflict at the end when he you know defeats him. So that's why I can see that scene where the the the, the ceiling with the monster is more of a Hollywood esque sort of confronting the demon. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So I, I think that's what to me is sort of missing. It's not necessary, but it's sort of missing that him confronting the physical formation of hell which is kind of dumb i couldn't see why they got rid of well, it but i can see why they would no, need it sort of. yeah he just goes to hell and he's wrapped up and that's it and then he then daniello yanks him out so there's no real conflict and there's no real um narrative villain because he himself is the villain because he's he's not himself the villain but his mind is the villain or this hell is the villain that he's going through yeah so uh it's a, it's a really complex storyline but if you this is this really is a film that is the journey more than it is the solution so um yeah i, I think, would agree with that i think for what it is like uh, that really works um in its 
stylized choice. I think what the director did with the film was really, um, it was really harrowing. Yeah, I'm, like, what he did. I'm okay with it ending this way, but yeah. And also, I'm taking it with a grain of salt because it's like this was made in 1990. Yeah. So, you know, this hasn't been done like 8,000 times. But and uh, for the type yeah, of film that is, much, it's kind of a cop out ending, even though it makes sense. Right, and for the type of film that it is, it's 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 uh, really it's really needed. Like, you really need films like this. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's hard yeah. to find films like this that are good. Um, a, a friend told me a, a couple of good ones that are because uh, I asked him. I was like, "Are there any other films like this?" Because he said that he watches this film once a year at least, and I was like, "Okay, good." And I was like, "Just Who watches this." Uh, a, a guy that we both know that we uh, talk about sometimes, okay. <laughs> and uh, the one who had uh, choice words about The Walking Dead that you and I laugh about uh, in okay. disturbance. But uh, yeah, I think this type of film is sorely needed. You really, really need to see this type of film if you if you enjoy horror and you like you like a psychological horror. I like psychological horrors a lot, um, and I, I like when they're done, you know, with an adult flair when they're treated. Seriously, it's very mature. I like fun in my horrors, but you know, sometimes I want to see a psychological horror that is like, "Woo, that's cool." You know, what I mean, that's interesting. You know, it makes me think. Like this movie made me think a lot watching it, and that's very rare. Mm-hmm. And if you want to really read a good uh, article about it, um, there's hitfix.com. They wrote something called "You're Already Dead: Celebrating 25 Years of Jacob's Ladder," which a very, which is a very lengthy article where they actually talk to the writer and the director in the film on they spoil it concepts. In the title. Yes, <laughs> but it's a really good um, article to read. I have to uh, read the whole thing. But uh, anyway, and also Adrian Lin is a, obviously a very competent director. The guy, like I was looking up his stuff, and I, I remember I've seen a lot of his stuff, and he only does like so many movies a year like he he's one of those directors that makes one film then it fucks up and then he makes a good one that makes more money after it these are the films that this guy has made and i'm sure everybody has has heard of these he's like 76 now and he lives in england and um here's just a, a list of films that he's done uh un- unfaithful which is the one with uh, richard gear that made a lot of money that was a good movie uh lolita was a movie with jeremy jeremy irons where he you know he has a relationship with i think a 14 year old girl in the film and yeah. uh, it was a movie that they were like, oh, we can't show it in America because, you know, he's fucking a kid. Uh, and it went straight to Showtime. And then people are such uh, horny perverts that it actually got theatrical release because it was <laughs> it's all Showtime. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did Indecent Proposal. Uh, everybody remembers that movie. Jacob's Ladder. He did Fatal Attraction, Nine and a Half Weeks. Flashdance he did. So this motherfucker is one talented director. And I think he... I think he, yeah. uh, I forgot which director he was in line with that he worked with a lot, but he certainly is a very competent director and you should check out his work. And thankfully, he's now working on two films because uh, Unfaithful was the last movie he did in 2002, but he's doing two new films that I hear of. Oh, um, good. Uh, one with Michael Douglas and Holly Berry and one with uh, Nicole Kidman. So hopefully he'll get the best um, you know, work out of those groups of people, at least Michael Douglas for sure. And uh, Nicole yeah. Kidman, not I to shit on Holly Berry. Awesome. At least Holly Berry is still hot. Um, anyway, but he'll make a good movie with uh, Michael Douglas for sure. Anyway, with that, uh, what Douglas rating would you give hot. this film? Um, I would give this film a uh, nine. Uh, yeah, nine out of ten. Um, God, there's so many things. A nine out of ten. Having a loving, healthy relationship with your chiropractor where he will literally fight nurses that are doing nothing wrong with, uh, you know, IV stands to get you out of the hospital. I would uh, give this an 8 out of 10. Being a terrible dancer, a, a dancer so horrible with your girlfriend that she'd rather dance with a monster that puts a giant spike right up her ass and out of her mouth. And with that, Danny, uh, what's the final word? H H H H H H Punisher. The horror deconstruction.